Cat and Moose podcast. I'm Cat and I'm Moose. This is a true life podcast where we explore the quirks of being human. Hey Cat. Hey Moose. Hey Sarah. Hey Sarah. Hello. Cheers. Cheers. To an amazing 3 years. We've been doing three this podcast for 3 years, you years. guys. Congratulations, you guys. And this episode is uh, number 150 of our, you know, the full length episodes, I guess we call them. Yeah. Our internal family system numbering system Correct. <laughs> of episodes. Nothing you would care about, but we've done 150 plus episodes, you guys. Woo. Amazing. Cheers. Cheers. I am so impressed with us. Like, I, I, I just don't. Well, I do do a lot of things consistently. I I do a lot of things consistently for other people. And I feel like doing the podcast is something that I've done consistently as equally for you guys as for me. Like it's mm. life giving to me. Yes. And, um, and I feel like, like, yay, there's some sort of sign of good balanced health or something in there. Don't you think? Absolutely. Yes. I love that it's part of my weekly routine. Me too. I think it has helped all of us grow in mm-hmm. like a million different ways. Hey, if you want to get to know yourself, start a podcast where you have to share your shit every single week <laughs> and have two of your best friends respond to that. I mean, weekly, like unless yeah. you're in therapy, there's not a lot of ways you could do that. Right. And then you listen back a few days later and you go, oh, my God, did I share that? <laughs> but then you kind of have to, you're forced to work through it, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, I, I really think that it is one of the many ways to exercise and, and lengthen and strengthen the whole idea of neuroplasticity. You know, it's like, you're just working out your shit yeah. in front of everybody. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, well, if these ditches don't change into being more of a flat landscape <laughs> and new ditches are created, the whole world can know about it if they want to. Too. that's scary it is scary are you saying ditches or bitches yes i think she said bitches i knew it <laughs> if these bitches don't get out of my way that's, that's what i it. heard anyway i mean really <laughs> oh that's amazing so i thought a really fun way to celebrate three years of podcasting together and with our listeners and some of you have listened from the very beginning and have become friends of ours which is awesome yeah and some of you were friends of ours and then somehow got sucked into listening to the podcast and are no longer friends of ours correct <laughs> 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 or um, just stopped listening because we uh, expanded too many of your views. And in that case, you <laughs> wouldn't be listening right now. So Cr- cheers. So great. Cheers to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it would be super fun to start our 150th full length episode with a little game that I loved when I was a kid called Show and Tell. Oh. Ooh. Do you guys have good memories of show and tell as a kid? I I have good memories of show and tell as an adult. I really like to take um, my body body work practitioner. For some reason, I like to take her things like every week and like show her like, okay, so like (laughs) I did this or I made this or I drew this or whatever. And it's like, what is that? Like, I like I don't know what that is, but I, I love show and tell. I do, too. Like, I feel like as a kid. I was so excited about it because there were so many options, so many opportunities and stories to tell with whatever that one thing you were going to bring was. Mm. And I didn't give you guys a heads up on this, but I feel like we Mm. all have something that we has happened in the past few weeks that we could show and tell. Sarah, what was your experience as a kid with show and tell? Uh, Well, I was extremely shy as a child. And so getting up in front of the class or a group of people was was the hardest part for me. Um, but I was so excited when it was my turn and what to pick and all of the stuff. But then it was like, you get there and you're like, oh shit, now I actually have to like tell people about this. Yeah. Um, I'm more of a one-on-one or maybe like two, one-on-two kind of gal. Right. right. I am too. Sarah's Sarah's taking this deep quick. (laughs) (laughs) We always sat in a circle when I was a kid, like everybody would sit, put their chairs in a circle, which even that was very exciting to like mix up the norm. Oh, wow. That sounds more intimidating because now you're all looking at each other. 
Yeah, but it's better than you standing with your, you're the True. only one up yeah. front, right, you right, know? Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's better. It was better for me. Well, so you talking about being in a circle, and I I wasn't going to bring this up today because I thought it was stupid, and it may still be, but... Um, but don't worry, we'll still keep it in, because yeah. that's yeah. who we are. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> well, I was thinking the other day, I was out grilling. I think I was making steak on the grill, and as I was standing there, I was thinking, for some reason, of the game Duck, Duck, Goose. Mm, duck, yeah. Duck. Goose. I like that. And game. the the saying, so you would go like around the circle, right? Duck, 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 goose. And whoever was goose had to get up and chase you around mm-hmm. or something. And then I remembered there being a saying that went along with that game. My mother told me to pick the best one, and you are not it. Yes. Oh my gosh, I forgot about yes. that. Terrible. How horrible. It's terrible. That is horrible. It's like saying to one human in the circle, my mother, the matriarch of my being, has told me to pick the best one. I'm going to point you out as not that terrible. Like what in the world? Seriously. Thank you for reminding us of childhood trauma. We didn't remember (laughs) we had. Hey, I'd rather it come up and bubble and get the hell out of here. You know? (laughs) Yeah, me too. By the way, when I was in Minnesota, I learned recently that (laughs) only in Minnesota do they call duck, duck, goose. They call it duck, duck, gray duck instead of duck, duck, goose. Really? That's hilarious. (laughs) <laughs> I swear. I just, I mean, I, I can, let me just show you to prove it because it's so bizarre, but I just pulled it up on my screen and here it is. Most kids across the United States have played a game of duck, duck, goose, but not Minnesotans. In our state, we play duck, duck, gray duck. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I don't want to leave anyone out and just want to let you know that uh, Minnesotans, we see you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We see you and your gray ducks. I want to see your show and tell, Moose. What did you bring? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, well, I would like to show you something that children should stay away from. OK. <laughs> so these I'm showing it to our patrons and to Kat and Sarah here. Oh, it's a, it's they're called knockouts. And um, these are legal um gummies and so you know i was i don't know if anyone's heard of this company i'm gonna tell who the company is because they're delicious but steve's hemp hey shout out to wisconsin guys steve's hemp um we should tag them because they have such cool branding and all of Mm. its legal um thc but uh sometimes i partake when i need to relax and legal thc Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so um I bought these online and, and you know, gummies usually come in a 10 pack at 10 milligrams a pop. That's how they come. Mm. These are called knockouts. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes me think they're, they're bigger and heftier. Is that true? Yeah, but I, I didn't look at that. I just popped one <laughs> and I'm in the middle of my HR class, <laughs> like writing notes and highlighting and I sat there and went I am paralyzed right now (laughs) I am absolutely I literally thought and I'm not making fun of anyone who's had this but there's like a disease where you're trapped in your body and only your eyes can move that's where I was I literally was at my desk just as I am now and this is all I could do you guys and nobody was home this is all I could do (laughs) <laughs> and I couldn't figure out where I was. <laughs> I couldn't. I, I saw people passing by my window, my office, and I'm like this. Help. Help. <laughs> I can barely move my lips. And so I look over and I'm like, you know, I'm in my 40s now. So I'm like, I can't move. So I'm just squinting to see this thing. Can't see what it says. And so I get, I I move enough fingers to text Sarah, who was in Florida at the time. And I said, um, 
I think I'm dying. (laughs) (laughs) Dot, dot, dot. And just waited thinking, well, she'll see that and maybe give me a call. Maybe I can find a couple more fingers to like talk it through. And that happened, which was nice. Thank you, Sarah, for calling me. You're welcome. And I just said, I just want to say goodbye. (laughs) I think I'm dying. And (laughs) I couldn't even tell her that I... um, that I had partaken in in in, in these these blue raz lemonade knockouts. <laughs> I couldn't put it together, and so um, then I just started hysterically laughing to the point that Sarah could not understand a word I was saying. No, for like seven minutes, I just <laughs> I, I, everything she would say. It was just through laughter, and I go, nope, I didn't get that one either. Uh, nope, can't understand what you're saying. And uh, what was happening is I was telling her what had happened, that I had taken the gummies. She wasn't able to understand me. No. This was not the kind of laughter that you enjoy. I would like oh. to point that out. Oh. This was the most painful laughter. It was like... <laughs> Years and decades of trauma were <laughs> billowing out of me <laughs> thanks to my knockouts from Steve's hemp. So I just want to Ugh. let everyone know that <laughs> in the fine print of Steve's hemp, it says serving size one fourth of a gummy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that that's really the moral of the story is to read the bottle. Okay. And also... Call your friends when you're effed up, man, because yeah. they show up. I mean. <laughs> wow. That, what a great show and tell. <laughs> I mean, we should do more show and tell as adults. Yeah. Maybe it's just yeah. a weekly thing that we do. I, I realize I have one like prepared and I didn't even know it. I, I do too. What do you have, Sarah? Okay. So um, this is my show and tell. Okay. Um, it's a TikTok video I came across that just really brought a lot of joy to my life this week. And I wanted to share it with you. Thank God we have a millennial on staff, Kat, that can bring us the TikTok. <laughs> wait, we have a staff? I was going to say, wait, do we have, do we have payroll? <laughs> I would love no. to get in on that. <laughs> when I say staff. You mean infection? I mean, fr- <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We, we all have the staff. All right, show it to us, Sarah. <laughs> okay, all right. Here comes, here comes. Jarred this fart last night. Mm. <laughs> um, and my farts last night were smelling like... Oh. Nice. Grandma's <laughs> a old casserole, kind of. Oh, my <laughs> like God. A like lots of cabbage. <laughs> anyway, it's my first time using a mason jar from the dollar store, so I'm going to see if it works. No. Ready? Hmm. Be excited. Okay. I sealed it real tight. Oh, wow. Are you, are you nervous? Uh, a little bit. Look. Oh! oh, my God. Oh, my God, you guys. People jar their farts. No! Oh, my God. <laughs> that <laughs> that is disgusting that's laura danowski by the way if you want to follow her on tiktok oh man thanks that's amazing that's great right i don't even have anything else to say about it i've never done it i would love to try it that's disgusting would you i would love to try it okay because there there are certain times when <laughs> i just can feel <laughs> in my body that like what needs to come out is deadly it's <laughs> deadly and like yeah here's the thing everyone be honest e- even if you know it's going to be deadly this even the slightest sliver of you is curious what it smells like oh yeah oh um, Oh my God. <laughs> I'm very curious, Sarah. I, I like sometimes I'm kind of like, like, what is that? Like, what is the, it's like, how does my body <laughs> oh my extract God. nourishment from you guys are so sickening yeah, me out, whatever I'm eating and then let <laughs> the unnourishing stuff out. Like how yeah. it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's the same part of you. That's curious to look in the toilet after you go number two. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. This is not who we are. I am not going to receive this. I disagree. By the way, on the same topic, I did have a friend who we all know 
who is an artist in the industry. And the text read to me, this is all it said. I love the smell of my BO. Huh? (laughs) That's it. Yeah. I mean, what, like why? I mean, but why communicate that to you? Um, that's I'm, because they are really quirky like us. And they, mm-hmm. that's all they, that was their way of saying, I love you. And I'm thinking about you was a <laughs> random statement like that, which really makes me feel seen and known, you know, like, yeah, totally. I get it. It's something you guys would send me. So thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. That's awesome. All right, Kat, what is your show and tell today? Well, my show and tell has a little story to go along with it. So um, I had one of the most powerful bodywork sessions that I've had in a really long time last week. Um, And I went in with very specific intentions. I was like, okay, this is the thing that I want to do. This is what I like. I have done all the work I can do on my own to figure this thing out. Now I need some support and I need some help. And, um, and my bodywork practitioner was amazing. And, and, um, I got out of it, you know, I didn't know what I was going to get out of it. I did get out of it what I was looking for. And, um, it was basically, um, a really deep rooted message from two of my internal family systems Hmm. characters. And so, in, in this instance, um, I was communicating directly with the tiger and the red phoenix. Those are two of my internal family systems characters. And I know it's not traditional internal family system stuff, but I don't care what anybody thinks. Anyway, yeah, come on. It doesn't matter. I'm yeah, with you. Yeah. Whatever works yeah. for you. Yeah. And it works. It works for me. And it's amazing. And um, so fast forward. Um, a few days later, my mom was in town post surgery. My mom had these um, pins um, surgically put in her foot to help um, repair Ugh. something that was wrong with one of her feet, and um, she was in town for the appointment to get those out, which was really exciting in and of itself. Um, and we had a little bit of time to kill, and so I took her to the Berry Hill location of the Nashville Crystal Store. You know, the one where I got oh, yeah. all of my chakra mm. rocks for a lot of money. Oh, we know. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> so, um, so I was looking around in the store and I was like, I have so many rocks. I don't need any more like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I came upon this one pile of crystals that was called red tiger eye. And mm. I was like, Oh, like the tiger, like, cool. Yeah. Like, Oh, what if he had like a red eye, like the red Phoenix, isn't that kind of neat. And I picked up this stone and I don't know if you can see it, but it looks like it has a feather in it. Oh, wow. Wow. That is beautiful, Kat. That's really cool. So it's like the red eye of the tiger and the feather of the red phoenix all in one stone. And I was so moved by this. Yeah. So um, I've been carrying it around ever since I bought it. But then, like, I get nervous because when I sit down, it falls out of my pocket. Mm. And so I don't want to lose it. So now I'm super, like you know, attached to it, which is very non Taoist of me to have an attachment to anything. But, um, yeah, that's my, that's my show and tell. Here's what you need, Kat. Stick it in your bra. Oh, Oh. you know, then it's right by your chakra, your heart chakra. Oh, really? That's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Right there in that pocket. That's perfect. Thanks, Moose. But don't bend over. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, There's a lot of reasons for that. Okay. <clears throat> Guys, I I I wasn't going to share this cat, but to your IFS um point, anyone who doesn't know what internal family systems is, can you give a little a little bump, like a little heads up or maybe we can do it together just so we explain it well and then I have a little thing that happened around that this week too. Yeah. So my understanding of internal family systems is that um, we each have within us um, parts of our being. And I'll use myself as an example. Um, I I have a part that is the three-year-old, feisty, mad, angry, irrational version of myself. And then I have the 20-something-year-old version of me that is very analytical and very by the books and very by the rules and gets really pissed off when anything is off the rails and, and so on. And so basically what 
a practitioner has the opportunity to do or, or what a client has the opportunity to do is for those parts to speak with one another. And a lot of times when those different parts of ourselves are able to communicate with one another, we have like revelations or aha moments, or we realize like, oh, this is a, a pattern that mm. I am in. And it's not so much about being like, well, that's a good pattern or that's a bad pattern. It's just the awareness of the pattern. Yeah. So it's like whenever... You know, like I'll, I'll give you a great, a great example of a pattern that I have noticed. I have noticed that <clears throat> when Sarah edits the podcast, when I start talking and explaining something, she almost always puts music behind my voice. Mm-hmm. And so what I have told myself is that here comes the boring part of the podcast where Kat talks. So we need to have some music so that it's entertaining. That's what, that's what my pattern of what I do yeah. mm-hmm. and what I have realized and whether that's true or not actually doesn't matter you know it's like it's that that, that's beside the point what I have recognized is my awareness of that gives me the opportunity to go or she might be highlighting something really interesting that you're saying (laughs) exactly Exactly. you know and so just the awareness of that you know of that thing that happens um is part of what internal family systems work can can do so is that a decent explanation no that's really good it really is good and so often when you do and by the way if anyone wants to go deep on internal family systems uh the book that you should check out is no bad parts there's lots of books out there but that's um, by far the best. Written by Dick Schwartz, who actually yep. created IFS. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, so when we, if you've listened to past episodes where Kat has referred to like texts or, you know, I think my, I don't really talk to Carol anymore. Maybe she made her way into my full self or something. Hmm. But um, yeah, we've had like these critical voices in our head that we've talked about mm-hmm. that are IFS characters. And so, Um, This week in therapy, I had an intense session as well. So I'm glad the intensity is across the board here. Mm. (laughs) Um, And and, um, I had several parts come forward as they usually do. There's usually like you're talking and you feel like you're connecting with a part. And then all of a sudden you might be talking to like a scared part. And then this critical voice comes in and your therapist will be like, oh, did another part come in and then you ask them to step aside I always picture like a waiting room where they can (laughs) with a window where they can watch but they can't Mm. participate Um, but so this part came forward for me and we were calling it fear just because that's what it felt like Um, and it was really interesting I've never had this happen during the session um, the part and, and normally you would think it was another part entering, but I was very clear. It was the same part. The part actually said, I don't want to be called fear. I want to be called reality. Oh, wow. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and I'm telling you, it came up where it was out of my mouth to my therapist before I even processed what that meant because she, wow. she kept saying, can you ask fear this? Can we talk to fear? And so out of my mouth, sort of interrupting her, I said, it doesn't want to be called fear. It wants to be called reality. And mm. let me just tell you, my therapist reacted to it before I did. And <laughs> her face was, oh, shit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> damn, like you just put me in my place. But it was really interesting because as I went on to talk to that part, changing its name to reality, I had I had more peace mm-hmm. because this is really interesting and I haven't completely broken it down, but <clears throat> if it's reality, I can deal with it. Hmm. it and say it's the same scenario. So let's do worst case scenario for something. Say um, my, my worst case that always comes up in therapy is in quotes, I'm going to lose everything. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but that's mm-hmm. what comes up. So I will honor that, that that's what mm-hmm. comes up. And so say that that's worst case scenario And that's my fear. Like I'm attaching that to the word fear, but say that I have lost everything, right? (laughs) Like, and to me, I think that means like I lose my house and I don't know, like it's such a bizarre thing, but if that is my reality, I could deal with that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like Mm -hmm. if I, I'm not afraid of hard, that's never been something I'm afraid of. And so when this certain scenario that we were tracking through fear and then it became reality, 
became reality. And I went, Oh, so that's just how it's going to be. I was like, Mm -hmm. cool. Like I, I just had Mm -hmm. this sense of it is what it is, which we always Mm -hmm. talk about wanting to get to. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was just really interesting to me to see that shift from like that. The part even said, actually, I'm not representing fear. I'm representing what actually could happen. And then I wasn't mm. so afraid. Wow. It, it reminds me of um, our dear friend and brilliant artist, Margaret Becker. Um, do you remember her song on her project um, called Air? The song is called Dear John. Yes, I do know that song. And one of the lyrics says, the fear of losing you is much worse than it coming true. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's like that anticipation. Mm-hmm. And that, that fear is so powerful Mm. i mean like it's exactly what Mm -hmm. she's saying yeah it's in it's so beautiful and it's in it um because it's just describing it seems like what you're saying moose is that it's like the anticipation of losing everything like that that anxiety or fear what whatever you want to call it of losing everything does that feel more powerful than if you were to actually imagine yourself sitting in losing everything yeah, so like, uh, like to infinity and beyond. You what know what is I mean? That? Like, yeah, yeah. Because if and, and it's so funny because I was talking to a friend recently about this scenario that I'm walking through, and and they said something like that to me, and it means so much to me. Like they said, you know how to do hard, mm-hmm. and that grounded me immediately like I felt like Mm. roots went into the ground Mm. of like that's fucking right I do know Mm -hmm. how to do hard yeah and Mm -hmm. so if hard comes along like I do like in my mind hard's already coming you know what I mean like I live (laughs) waiting for the other motherfucking shoe to drop and so like I'm already ready for that so why am I bracing so bad Uh Uh and and the reality is the fear is driven by the outside. What will people think? Mm. What will people, how will people mm. receive me? How will I be rejected? And, mm. and, and this is just everywhere across my life. You know what I mean? Like wow. that, which is crazy because I'm an Enneagram eight, but also this is trauma, right? So like, it mm. doesn't fit into any personality code. I'm supposed to mm. not give a shit. But the reality is I'm shedding that, like I'm getting rid of that. And that is incredibly life-giving. Yeah. I'm so happy about that, Moose. That's beautiful. So like, like what has changed? Like, like when you said it's life-giving, like what, can you give me like an example? Yeah. I, I mean, I'll just say this, like I, I have begun collecting people and you guys are part of my collection that (laughs) can take the full me, right. Can, can handle it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in reality, that's not that hard to handle. Right. But I have a lot of opinions. I am full of justice, you know, all of these things. And I am choosing to quit things that no longer represent what, is like, um, a hell yes. Like I want it to be a hell yes or a no. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it's just like a, I probably should, it's a no. Yeah. 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 And we've talked about that. I mean, Mm -hmm. you guys have part of that journey has been your guys's like decision-making skills of going like, I know this could hurt, but I'm saying no. Mm -hmm. And, and guess what? We're fine. Mm -hmm. We've survived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I want to share this because this, this speaks volumes to it. It describes kind of, we talk about songs giving us language when we don't have the words. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of my favorite artists, um, her name is Lisa Congdon and, um, she's based out of Portland and I, I have art of hers all over my office and she posted this and, and Kat, I would want, I want you to read it if you might. Um, it's in the, the image with her art is says loud quitting, mm-hmm. which you might think is the opposite 
we've talked about quiet quitting. Quiet quitting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I just absolutely loved how she described this. Okay. Lisa Congdon said, I've been thinking a lot lately about quitting and I've been on a systematic mission to examine and quit everything in my life work that feels finished or draining or one-sided or obligatory or without purpose or joy. So far in the past nine months, I've quit alcohol, food restrictions, teaching college, my podcast, more on that to come, two boards of directors, working on Fridays, working on umpteen client projects at once, coffee dates with people I don't know, most public speaking, writing any more books, several friendships, and most weekday evening plans. I have not felt as happy comma quote-unquote balanced if such a thing exists and such a sense of spaciousness in nearly 20 years Mm. i've begun to think of this as loud quitting intentional communicated assertive as opposed to passive Mm. and unapologetic so to be clear this not necessarily the opposite of quiet quitting which is about not going above and beyond in the workplace which i also support (laughs) just simply my way of overtly claiming and taking control over my time in a way i haven't in my entire life because for most of my 55 years i thought it was literally my duty to please and serve others Mm. ironically one of my core values is service But I've come to realize that when I serve others out of joy and connection and purpose and not out of a sense of obligation, there are only rewards. Wow. In addition to quitting, I've also been changing the structure of other things in my life to create more ease, including in my nonprofit and in my business. I am so lucky to be married to someone who not only fully supports all of these efforts, but is similarly engaged in this process herself. I have so much more to say about quitting, and I'll encapsulate most of that in my final podcast episode, which will happen in early April. For the record, I've been thinking about and working toward this moment for years. It did not happen overnight and took a lot of emotional work, connecting with my core values and letting go of my old beliefs about who I am and why I'm here on this earth. Curious if any of you have gone through a similar process or feel ready or inspired to do something similar. Hope everyone has a solid Wednesday. Hmm. Isn't that so good, you guys? Yeah, that's powerful. Good for her. Good for you, Lisa. That's awesome. Congratulations. Are there things you guys want to quit? Hmm. I feel like I've been doing that recently in my life. Yeah. And I feel like at least this year for me has been, um, I, I can't think of a more fancy way of saying than like new beginnings, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, I, I am in the, I'm reaping the benefits of, of kind of quitting or leaving. Yeah. Uh, something that I've been doing for a while. Yeah. And I think, I think me too, Moose. I, um, I was having a moment the other day where I was lamenting, um, someone in my life who I'm aware needs something. And, um, I said to myself, like, I have every ability to provide that for that person. And then I stopped and I was at a traffic light and I said, I am not in charge. 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 I am free of responsibility. I am free of responsibility (laughs) it really it really made me feel good to say like that that is not my thing to control it's not my thing to take care of and that doesn't mean that we can't be awesome and giving and generous and all of that but but Mm -hmm. this particular thing would have like it would have continued a cycle of unhealth if, yeah. if I were to do the thing and and so I think the thing that I've been trying to quit is like trying to like puppeteer and control things that are not my job not my job to control you know and and sometimes my my willingness or my activity toward enabling actually couldn't help stunt growth and it's like I don't want to do that I I don't want to do that yeah yeah me too Kat I I control is usually what I want to quit you know because I consistently feel like I have to be the one to fix whatever is going to happen and all hell will break loose. So I must be consistently vigilant. 
Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's beautiful, Moose. What beautiful growth in all three of us. Thank you for for highlighting that and for being vulnerable and sharing sharing your experience in that. That was really, really powerful for me. Can I share one more thing with you guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to give a little background on this video and why it meant so much to me. It's from We Can Do Hard Things podcast. Um, So her sister's going to share here. It's really quick, but... She's going to share here about hypervigilance. And this really meant a lot to me because I have some PTSD when it comes to going to dog parks because Sarah's sweet, wonderful dog, who is also my dog, um, two times has been in a dog fight at a dog park. And it wasn't it, well, he wasn't the aggressor, but he's not going to sit there and take it either. Right. And. And so in this one particular dog park, um, which is the coolest dog park, Kat, we've all been to it. It's the Two Rivers Dog Park um, where you get to walk three little loops, makes a mile. And you're like walking with your dog and it's all fenced in. But every time I go there, I have full on like nearly a panic attack. Not quite that Mm. bad. And so on the way there, I'm trying to like self-regulate and trying to breathe. And then I try to talk Sarah into, can we just walk our dogs on the path instead of going into a dog park. Um, but anyway, I, th- I, I have this in other areas of my life too, but it's a small area that I have trauma that I'm fearful that w- my dog is going to get into a dog fight. And my previous dog got into a very serious dog fight and it was horrible. So there's some of that, but I wanted to share this video because those of us who are hyper vigilant and, constantly thinking that our job is to protect everyone you might you might feel like this makes sense and by the way this is um glennon doyle's sister who she calls sister which i think looks strikingly similar to paula abdul (laughs) (laughs) okay here we go oh like me who feel responsible for taking care of people's stuff comes from a deep place of fear. It comes from a deep place. And mine comes from this deep fear that I am alone, that it is all up to me, that I can't stop patrolling with vigilance because then things will fall apart. Mm -hmm. Um, So when that happens, when that part of me is activated, my reaction is not commensurate with reality. Like it is missing the bus is just as big of a deal as some really huge thing because Mm -hmm. I, the burden I feel is like, see, if it, see, it's just an example that if I'm not taking care of everything, everything falls apart. It's not, it doesn't, it's not Mm reality-based. And so I am spinning in my head and it is physiological. It's something that's happening physiologically to me and I need to be grounded in my body is what I have learned to stop that activation. Isn't that so like, what did you take from that cat? Well, it, it reminded me of, as I'm sure um, you won't be shocked to learn, I've signed up for another class. And um, <laughs> <laughs> in, 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 in my class this week, this is a virtual class that's going to be virtual all the way up until May. And then in May, um, those of us participating um, have the opportunity to all be in person for a weekend. And um, one of the things that the instructor said um, is she said, she was talking about like energy work and balancing the body's energy flows and, and life force energy and all of that. And, and we were talking about the differences between Eastern philosophy and medicine and Western philosophy and medicine. And the point wasn't to say one is good and one is bad. It was just Mm. to talk about the differences. And she said, let me tell you this. She goes, if I am hanging off of the edge of a cliff by my fingernails and you as a practitioner, observe me in this situation and offer me the opportunity to relax. I'm going to want to kill you. 
<laughs> I pictured, I, I didn't know you were going to say relax. I pictured somebody just giving a little massage while they're uh, <laughs> could hanging I, off could the I edge. Could I rub your shoulders <laughs> yeah. while, while you're hanging off the edge of a cliff? Let me touch your chakra <laughs> while you're yeah, laying there. Yeah. <laughs> and she was just saying how it's like, you know, kind of pick the right modality for the right moment in time. And so that's what it, <laughs> that's what it makes me think of is it, it's basically like, okay, touch base with reality ground. Like what, what is actually, you know, uh, necessary for the situation? You know, I, yeah. I feel like that's, that's how that hits me. What she said. Yeah. I feel like, you know, when she said it's a physiological response, mm -hmm. like that actually helps me take a deep breath because, you know, it is so physiological. Like it, I cannot get past it because it's, it, I am just in a spiral. Yeah. And so to recognize like this may not be reality and to mm -hmm. take space to like process that. So important. It mm -hmm. is. It's really important. And, um, just to give a shout out to the body workers of the world, like one of the things that, that I learned in this class that reminds me of what you just said, Moose, is that, you know, basically like, like we have armoring and we have defenses. Like when you talk about physiological, like there are a reason that we have a knot in our shoulder. There are reasons that we have mm -hmm. that one place in my back that just, oh, it's always tight, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's like those, those places of armoring and those defenses that we've developed are there for a good reason. Like we mm. have needed to protect ourselves at, at some point in time. And, um, a lot of times, like we don't even realize that, Oh my gosh, that's there for a good reason. We're just mad at it. We're like, I've got this damn knot in my shoulder. And it's yeah. Ah, you know, and it's like, okay, well let's thank the knot for being there and doing some job that it has been necessary to do. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that, that I'm learning about, um, the type of body work practitioner that I want to be is I want to be able to help the client become aware of that armoring and evaluating why it's there and then figuring out for themselves, do I still need it? Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do I still need to be in this position in life? Because if I'm being beaten with a baseball bat every day, it's not going to be a good idea for me to relax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like, I need, I need this tension, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really cool that there's all kinds of opportunities that we're learning about and all these different things that we're doing where, you know, practitioners can really help us become aware of our patterns like that and then start to go like, okay, now that I have an awareness, I get to choose because right. before yeah. I didn't get to choose. It was just my body's physiological response to a threat. Right. So can you do the work with me around my weight? Because I don't think I need it anymore. And I do think it has protected me in a lot of ways, but I'm ready to, is that really something we could do? Absolutely. And the beautiful mm. thing is, is it will be you and your body working at the pace that yeah. your body knows is right for you. And yes, I can wow. certainly, certainly support that. I would be honored. Mm. I f thanks. I would love that because I feel like, um, like I, there, I feel like I, that what you said runs so deep for me that there has been purpose for it. And for so long, I've just been mad at my body that it's, mm. you know, not whatever, you know, not able to like get rid of it. And, you know, I'm mm. doing the things at certain times and I feel like I can't get rid of it. But I do think that there is like an internal family systems connection there of like, you know, we ask that part often, what job are you there to do? And do you want to continue doing that job? And it's like. Yeah. I don't know what part's holding on to all this, but it's time to shed some chub. <laughs> yeah! Come on. Let's do it. Producer Sarah Reed. To find out more, go to catandmoosepodcast.com. Cat and Moose is a BP production.